Great. Thank you, Scott. I just mentioned I have, I have an IMDb listing because of that documentary, which I never thought I would get in my life. So there you go. Um, so uh, as always, the topic kind of springs organically from stuff I hear our clients talking about or stuff in my own life. And, and this week, a lot of client talk had to do with obsessions. And I want to talk a little bit about the nature of obsessions, what they do, where they come from, but more importantly, what we can do about them if they start to hijack our lives. Um, so obs obsessions basically are this closed universe of thoughts that kind of go in circles and we get fixed on something and it becomes very, very hard to break the connection with our obsession about whatever it is that we're obsessing about. Addictions are notorious for that because we have our target goals of whatever the behavior or the substances, the feeling they are trying to uh, numb or step out from or amplify. And so obsessions are true. Um, they, they are partners in the addictive process, but they can also occur in other things as well. And so um, obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, is uh, where someone has this obsessive thought and the compulsion to do behavior to relieve that thought. That is an anxiety disorder. And other kinds of anxiety disorders also are characterized by obsessive thoughts, where people just get a worry, they get a concern, they get an idea in their head, and it's really, really hard to shake. And anybody that's ever had obsessive thinking, um, which is probably most people attending this tonight, um, has struggled with it. And they know how terribly uncomfortable it is because it really hijack your day, ruin your nights. Um, when I get on these days, they tend to be in the middle of the night, which ruins the night's sleep uh, because things are always that much worse or seeing that much worse at three o'clock in the morning than they do when the sun comes up. So, so these obsessive thoughts are something that does happen. They hijack ourselves and, and they kind of hyper-focus us onto the obsessive uh, target. So we, we gradually become numb to people, to events, uh, to other kinds of things going on in our life. It really just takes us out of our life while our mind just replays the same dialogue, the same images, the same words. It's this repetitive thing that just is so maddening about an obsession. And if they're mild and they come in various forms and strengths, uh, if they're relatively mild, we can usually work on them and distract ourselves to, to kind of disengage from them. But if, if they're stronger, our thoughts begin to focus, our whole mind starts to go to work in like this whirlwind of thoughts and, uh, and really it's a closed system. We just kind of go around circles with no outlet and no information. And they, they run in circles, they feed incessant worry. Um, we go up into fantasy, we go up into search for answers. Um, and in many cases, that leads just kind of this paralysis. We get stuck and it's a very uncomfortable place to be. And what do addicts do when they get stuck or in that paralysis? It leads them to a compulsive behavior. So this obsessive thinking is really not just a result of the addictive behavior, but it's actually a cause of the addictive behavior too that we can sort of obsess about things. And we can start out obsessing not about our addiction, but about a worry or about a fear or about bills that we paid or something you know, down the road that we're worrying about. That can be enough to distract us and lead us directly to our addictive coping mechanism. And so uh, it's really something to, to be aware of and, and be careful about. So I really want to focus on solutions. So what do we do if we have this? Um, always there's a feeling underneath those obsessions. So I think a great place to start is to ask yourself, well, what am I feeling? What, what is going on here? And that what am I feeling sounds easy, right? But I know for a lot of addicts, it's very difficult to know what we're feeling and determine that. But um, that's a really important question. And we have to sometimes wait patiently for the answer because we may not always get the answer in the time frame that we want. But I think certainly being sitting down and trying to calm ourselves and, and ask the question is a really important one. And by the way, that's an important thing to do in any process is like sink down, okay, drop out of your head, which my, remember my sponsor told me the, the space between your ears is a very dangerous neighborhood. So stay out of that neighborhood and drop down here and just drop into your heart, see what you're feeling. So ask yourself, what am I feeling? Um, mindfulness is a huge tool here. Mindfulness is that skill of being aware, noticing things, without judging it, so without telling us that's stupid or not this again, or rolling our eyes or whatever we do, but just to really notice it and make the connection, just to be aware. And then one other thing is really helpful is to use other senses. With obsessions, as I said, our, our focus gets narrowed. We start to just have this very small little world of 
these swirling thoughts over the same thing over and over again, if we can start to actively engage other senses, and that this is a great place for that five, four, three, two, one grounding exercise, right? Five things I can see, four things I can hear, three things I can touch, and so on. Just we use those other senses, to, and they start to. What we're doing is we're bringing in new, new data. We're bringing in new sets of information, even if it doesn't directly relate to our obsession. It helps unlock the brain, which is stuck in this circle. And so, new thoughts, or rather, new new senses, um, really do start to help open open up the system. Um, we can listen. To, you know, and this might involve activity. So it, say I want to he uh, hear something, I could listen to music, right? Or I could, I could do some yoga, I could do some stretching, I could take a walk. I think it's anything like that that helps open up the universe. Another idea is to externalize it. So we have to get this circular craziness out of our head, out of ourselves. And a good way to do that is journaling. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like to journal, uh, but it's a great way to externalize these things. And if you really want to um, get extra credit, um, try journaling uh, with your non-dominant hand. Because when we do that, it, it just sets a whole different neurological process up in our brain that isn't quite as automatic. And sometimes what you write on paper will surprise you when you do that process. So journaling is an important thing. Any, anything we do to externalize, sharing it too, by the way, talking about it with somebody that's not gonna judge us or ridicule us, but just gonna listen and maybe kind of give us a little bit of a firm push to kind of break the routine and do something different. Um, connect with nature. You know, this is, I, I remember a friend of mine talking about the most soothing thing he could do was to go out and get his hands in dirt. And he was a gardener, right? And so he did his flower beds and his gardens, but it was that, that, sense of being connected to the earth was very grounding for him. And it, it just kind of shifted gears out of the obsessive thought, again, out of his head into this other area of being. Um, engage your spirituality. If you have a, a spirituality that works for you, this is a time to call on it and use it and really um, activate it to your, to your best uh, ability. Um, Engage and expand your social network. I mentioned sort of talking to somebody before, people are protective in this. People and that connection that we get from other people is, is protective. It's, all, it's the best word I can say for addiction. That keeps us at lower risk for acting out. It keeps us in a better place. It keeps us, it's a safeguard that counteracts or counterbalances some of the negative stuff that we can do in our head. So that net social network is incredibly important. Um, another area is to, to use a different part of your brain, right? And when we're engaged in this thinking, all that, so those thoughts, um, they're, they're right out of our left brain, right? And, they're, um, and so we want to engage the other part of it, the more creative side of our brain, write, play music, journal, um, do anything, paint, do something that's creative, that is the opposite of thinking. And it'll sort of distract you and it also kind of engages a more three-dimensional activity in your brain that will help. And then finally, you know, look at your hobbies, your interests, purpose. It's a great way to distract yourself. And distraction is a very powerful uh, thing here. If we can sort of break the, the power of that obsession by distracting ourselves. And then finally, I, I always like to put a kind of a positive spin on things to do. <clears throat> and then here, feed your joy, right? Just do something that makes you happy and something that makes you joyful. And I think that's just really important too. I think sometimes we're caught in those obsessive loops. We just, we torture ourselves and everything, the whole world looks pretty awful. And I think if we can just kind of insert a little joy and um, even if it means all by ourselves, we don't need to wait for anybody else to be joyful with us. We can decide to be joyful and go for it. So those are just a few tips to uh, understand obsession and break the obsession. But it's really valuable because I guarantee at any moment, anybody it could be uh, overtaken by that obsessive thinking and we need to really have tools at our hand to, to escape from it. I think that's it. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, David. Um, uh, most of the people are here, I think we know because they or someone they care about um, has an addiction. Um, and, and obsession is, you know, there are 11 criteria in the DSM-5, which is the diagnostic manual. Um, for addiction, any two of which is enough to, for a diagnosis. But in the real world, we tend to use 
three basic criteria. Number one is preoccupation to the point of obsession with a substance or a behavior or whatever it is. Um, and, and then we look for an, an inability to quit and stay quit. We call it loss of control and then negative consequences. Those are the three primary um, criteria. How does this differ from, because obsession is not limited to just addiction. So how does this differ from like OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorders, things like that? Right, I think the also difference, feature obsession. Right, I mean, it, it can look the same, I guess, if you're just looking at the behavior without any context. But I think what the difference is, is the origins of the obsessive thinking. So if somebody has OCD, for example, obsessive compulsive disorder, that's really being driven by a level of anxiety that's that's within them. And that can be genetic, it can be biochemical, it can be um, other kinds of factors that, that feed it. So, so when we see obsessive behavior, we can we have to really kind of figure out, okay, what's the cause of this? Most of the time, if we're working with addicts, we can pretty pretty much safely assume it's some something related to the addiction itself. But but as you mentioned, obsessive thinking is not at all limited to addiction. So we really have to look at the cause of it. And therefore the solution is different, right, too. If, if somebody is not an addict, but suffering from obsessive thinking, they can really benefit. There's two, actually two protocols. One would be um, therapy, typically cognitive behavioral therapy of some sort, and in some cases, medication. The SSRI antidepressants, certain of them are very good for obsessive thinking. Um, so, and, then, and that doesn't mean that you can't have combined, right? So we've had clients at Seeking Integrity who had the classic uh, OCD, right? The counting ceiling tiles and squares in the rug and you know all that kind of stuff that just is so distracting and overwhelming. It's very troubling for that person. And they were also addicts. So they, so they had the addictive thinking about their behaviors or their drugs plus the other stuff, right? So they, you can have both, but generally it's really important to figure out, okay, where is this coming from and what's the difference? And there's also, I think, with addiction, it, it isn't there? There has to be an element of pleasure attached to the substance or the behavior. Like right. you know, compulsive hand washing. I don't, you know, I don't get any pleasure out of that. Right. But compulsive right. drinking, kale, uh, you know, I get high from it. Right, and you know, compulsive kale eating, not so much, right? It just it doesn't well, get the dopamine reward. Really like kale. <laughs> I do. I, I will admit, I like kale, but I, I'm never pulled to the point of obsession about it. Um, but yeah, so the, so the magic juice, you know, with, with addiction is dopamine. And if there's a dopamine piece, which we used to know 10 years ago, we used to think that dopamine was all about making us like something. Now we know it's more about the preoccupation. It's about the obsession because dopamine has a memory. It's like, wow, that was good last time. Let's do it again. And, and so that is the sort of secret sauce in the addictive obsession, dopamine. Yeah, we remember the pleasure and we want to repeat it. And we start to use it eventually as a coping mechanism to escape from reality, which exactly. a lot of times, and is OCD also a coping mechanism or is that different? Yeah, it is actually a coping mechanism for anxiety, right? So um, what OCD is, if I have an, uh, an anxiety disorder, uh, and this isn't true for all anxiety disorders, but with OCD, I am trying to quell the anxiety within me by doing some ritual in the real world that I, magical thinking says it's going to make it better. So if I, you know, lock my door in the same pattern as closing my windows and turning off my stove and do, then, then that anxiety will go away. The problem is it doesn't, right? But we develop these elaborate rituals and they tend to grow with an OCD case, uh, the they'll, they'll rituals become more and more elaborate. And if you miss, mess something up, you have to go back to the beginning and start all over again. So it's a very painful, um, we kind of joke about obsession, but it's a really painful thing for people to experience. It's debilitating when it, when it totally. runs off the rails. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm slightly OCD. You know, I hang my pictures with the laser pointer and a level, but I do that too. it doesn't rule my life. <laughs> right. Know? Right. I mean, I'm, I will straighten those pictures. You know, every time we have an earthquake, I get out the level and I go around and straighten all the pictures in my house because I can't stand it if they're not. But it doesn't rule my life. I don't have the ritual of, you know, I tap my foot three times and, you know, right. then I lock the door and then I hang the picture, you know. Right. No, exactly. Yeah. And I've had clients, you know, they would, you know, their social life was affected because they'd invite somebody over and they, um, the person would set their soda down on the coaster and the person would have to get up and 
align the coaster with the edge of the table. You know, and that, that kind of stuff just really interferes with a normal life and having normal uh, friends, right? It just gets in the way. We've got uh, several questions here. Type your questions into the Q&A feature. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, often we get through all of them, sometimes we don't. So get them in early. Um, first one here, I am a male sex addict in recovery for 11 months. My partner is very supportive of my sobriety and recovery. Okay. Um, what are some trust building exercises aside from daily recovery work and daily rigorous honesty practices that my partner and I can engage in? What a great question. Trust building exercises. Beautiful. And congratulations, by the way, and to your partner as well. That's that you guys are really working it. That's I love that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the single biggest thing I can recommend is, uh, and you may be doing it anyway, is a daily check-in. And it doesn't have to be long, it can be 10, 15 minutes, but really heartfelt um, checking in of where you're at emotionally, where you're at um, with worries, with communication, how your partner is doing, what they're feeling, just really a connection uh, that that is a way of kind of helping each other understand where you're at and you can solve problems that way as well. And I think because most addicts, sex addicts particularly have what we call intimacy disorders, uh, I think I like my clients to really face each other and hold hands and make eye contact, right? So there's no squirming out or escape, but just you can talk and share. And I think that idea of, of mirroring, um, of re, you know reflecting back what you just heard, the idea of active listening, where you just, you give body language to indicate your um, you're right in line with what your partner is saying. You give feedback. Uh, you you express uh, empathy and compassion. Gee, I can understand how you feel that way, and I can just you start to connect. So that that's one area of those uh, daily connections that really start to communicate and keep people on track. Um, David, you mentioned I, a couple of times um, while you're doing that, not just eye contact, but left eye to left eye. Yeah. Is there a, a neurobiological reason that works so well? Because I've tried it a couple of times and it really works. <laughs> there is. Um, and I don't think, at least I don't understand the whole neurobiology. I don't think it is well understood, but there is something about that left eye to left eye that if you can do it, you can really, it goes very deep very quickly. Um, and it's hard, um, but it does. So yeah, left eye to left eye, if you can do it, uh, kind of a gaze, it's a gaze. And when we, our eyes are quite powerful. We are in kind of visual mode all the time, but there's different, um, there's what's called soft vision, which is actually kind of hypnotic. And there's, our eyes are quite powerful for different kinds of seeing, but but that left eye to left eye is really critically important for that. Um, and the other thing I was gonna just suggest is just doing things together. I think, um, the, the, one of the tasks of any couple in recovery is to kind of create new memories, right? To create fun memories, to, to create novelty. Remember, addiction loves novelty and human beings like novelty. A marriage likes novelty. And, and so we can't just kind of do the same thing over and over again. But I think we have to kind of keep it interesting. And that, that may mean taking a walk to someplace you've never been or if we could ever travel again, take a, take a trip or do something fun, do something, you know, if you've never gone bowling, go bowling or try something different and a little challenging. And I think when there was a, a beautiful study in the UK some years ago that um, predicted, it, it looked at new couples, people that were just getting together. And it, it was attempting to predict the longevity of those couples. And it was a long long-term survey. And so several years later, they, they did the results. But what they did initially with those new couples is they gave them a task, like one of those um, boxes, you order a piece of furniture and it comes in a box you know, three by two inches wide and with 8,000 parts, none of which are totally complete. And you know it's maddening and probably has caused more than one divorce. But I think if the, the study basically showed the more couples could cooperate, and work as a team, the, the better their chances of survival. And, and, and that was just documented and, and that's been replicated since. So I think the more we can work with our partners in collaboration toward not only our marriage, but putting together something from Ikea or, or you know, um, doing some kind of walk, it's really helpful. So I think just doing stuff together, creating new memories, 
and not allowing yourselves to fall into the same old, same old. Yeah, and, and uh, I mean, that just leads into the two of the three things that I, that I had here. Um, one of them was to, to be vulnerable with, with each other. And that means yeah. we're talking about our feelings, which you, you mentioned, we're, we're also trying new things where, and I think that's really important. Um, just trying new things as individuals, trying new things as a couple. Um, and then as far as, you know, assembling an Ikea, you know, dresser or something, um, which I think is what we were all picturing, <laughs> something from Ikea. Um, right. If there's something about taking on those seemingly impossible tasks together um, that makes you realize you're on the same team. So instead of getting mad at each other, you can get mad at the problem, which is the incomplete directions that are half in Swedish, um, you know, or, or whatever. And, and that's a, a lesson that we can take to other aspects of a relationship. You know, we are on the same team. We may not agree on something, or I may be mad about something. There's a problem that we need to solve, but we need to solve it. Instead of yelling at each other, let's come up with a solution. We're on the same team. Um, and I think that's great. And then I just wanted to, because you use the term rigorous honesty in the question, I think it's really important to define that for anybody who's new. Rigorous honesty is telling the truth and telling it faster. If there's something your betrayed partner would want to know, you tell it. You don't wait to be asked. Um, and if you're asked, you answer the question and then you provide all other relevant information. You don't make your partner dig. Rigorous honesty is telling the truth and telling it faster and it's actively telling the truth instead of passively you know having the other person dig for the truth well i told her everything yeah she, it took her three weeks to dig it out of you know that is not active truth telling that's really passive not very rigorous honesty so i, I love that you're working on rigorous honesty um and, and that's great that's the biggest thing right there is just being honest um, i i mean it including the power of honesty. I mean, it's just it's it's essential and vital. And I think sometimes people um, forget that lies of omission aren't the whole truth either, right? So it's important to uh, talk about everything, including things you might not have. Now, the exception I would say of a disclosure, which is a more formal process. We don't want to do those staggered disclosures; can be very harmful to a partner. But, but I think um, that rigorous honesty is essential for sure. Uh, that's, and that, and this is something that's always frustrating to partners, I think, but um, addicts, you know, lie and have been in the habit of lying and it takes a while. We've talked on this webinar before about how, you know, just it's automatic over stupid stuff that you, there's no need to lie over. It just kind of spills out of our mouths. That, that's obviously not okay, but it takes a while to change that. And, um, so I think what Scott just said, it, it's going to happen. You're going to, even over something stupid, but correct it as soon as you can. And, yeah. and that's the key. Yeah. A lot of couples will have a boundary. If I catch myself keeping a secret or telling you a, a lie, even a little white lie, um, that's not acceptable, but I have 24 hours to come clean. And if I come clean within 24 hours, you can still be mad about whatever it is I was trying to hide, um, but you won't be mad that I didn't come clean right away. You'll give me 24 hours grace period to come clean. And that's because, you know, as David said, as addicts, we have a really ingrained habit of lying um, and keeping secrets and covering up and, and it takes a while to break it. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, next one here. I, I am a sex addict working in recovery program I have a sponsor, go to SA meetings, doing the 12 steps, good for you. <clears throat> Every few weeks, I find myself having intrusive dreams where strangers seduce and flirt with me. Um, this is something I never did um, before or after D-Day. Um, um, person says these dreams belong in my middle circle. We'll talk about that. Um, do you have any recommendations regarding what I could do to manage these re recurring dreams? <laughs> so it sounds like an acting out dream, even if it's not an old acting out behavior, which right. is that common, because I have thoughts on that, but also dreams, do they belong in the middle circle? <laughs> and then what can we do about it? Right, okay, so dreams are fascinating, first of all, but 
dreams are something that bubble up out of our subconscious that we have no control over. So um, you, you have no choice over what you dream about. Dreams are um, involuntary, if you will. So the content of the dream, we have no choice, it, it, it happens. What we do have a choice about is what we do with that, right? And we can, we can take it and we can not get triggered by it and not run with it and not indulge in it and not go there and think about it, even though we're now awake, or we can just kind of let it go. I, I think it's a very close parallel to the three second role we talk about, where you see somebody who is triggering on the streets, you know, a sexy person or a sexy image. And what do you do with it? You, you don't have any control over that either, right? Somebody could walk in front of your car, have no control over that, but you do have control over what you do with that. And we talk about the three second rule and rehumanizing and, and all of that. So I think the same principle applies here. I think I would um, talk about it. Sometimes dreams like that. And I remember in my early recovery, especially I would have drunk dreams, which were very disturbing to me that I thought, oh my God, it's, what does this mean? And, and honestly, it means nothing. It means that your brain is still um, swirling around some of that stuff. It's part of my human experience in my life. And, and over time, they become less common. And I can't think of the last time now I, I had one. It's been years probably. So, but I, that doesn't mean I couldn't have one. And it doesn't mean that I'm doomed to relapse. It just is my brain kicking up something that it was triggered to kick up. So I think to really process it, talk about it. Uh, sometimes people find it helpful to journal. That really, it's similar to the stuff I talked about with relieve, releasing obsession, where I think it's it, you really have to externalize it. I, I don't think it's good to bottle up. Some rather than wake your partner, some people journal. Um, I have had dreams that are upsetting enough over time that I woke up my partner to talk about it, rarely, maybe once or twice in 15 years. But, but I think those things do happen. Um, now, if it's Recurring dreams, if it's patterns, I think that's totally something to take to therapy because I think a therapist can help um, understand dreams work in symbols. Dreams don't work so much in language. And so um, the symbolism might be important or relevant and dreams can be very powerful. And, and I know people who keep dream journals and start to see patterns. And the more you try to remember your dreams, the better you'll get at it. Um, and so that's, that's useful. But I think these kind of dreams that are kind of this addictive behavior is not something you want to have more of. I just, I would kind of let it, it's, I, I picture the stuff kind of bubbling up and releasing and it's kind of bubbling up in your mind and it's, re, it's discharging with that dream and it's gone. But I, I would talk about it as need be, journal about it. Um, so I don't think you have that many control over dreams yourself, just what we do about them. Uh, and I don't think they mean much of anything. Um, in, in, in terms of the, the nature of the dream not being an actual acting out behavior, um, do you have thoughts on that? Because I do, but I, I'd like to hear your, you know way more about <laughs> dreams and dream analysis than I do. Um, do you have thoughts on why that might come about? Um, tell me what you're thinking, because I'm... Well, I mean, first of all, I, 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 I want to say that the acting out dreams that I, I had and still once in a great while have, um, they're definitely acting out dreams. They're, they would definitely be a bottom line behavior for me. They tend to not be things that I did before. Um, I, don't know, I don't know why that is. I think you know, there's always a symbolism in dreams and there's always, you know, you know and I kind of read into this when you know, strangers seducing me and flirting with me, um, maybe your a lot of your addiction was about feeling validated as a person um you know feeling wanted and desired and and wantable and likable or whatever um and maybe um that part of the addiction is awake and and wanting to get that need fulfilled I see what you're saying. um you know and okay. and um you know maybe um you know talking to your partner and asking your partner to flirt with you a little bit or something that maybe it'll help. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm really just throwing stuff at the wall. So that's my thinking, David. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. And we do have these, you know, core issues, right, underneath our addiction, like the need for validation or um, need to compensate for not feeling worthy or, and those themes stay there, even though our addictive behavior changes in recovery. 
but those themes stay there until we kind of work them through in therapy. And so I can see um, old ways of set, rather new ways of satisfying old issues, right? In the form of dreams, your, your, your brains are creative and they're coming with maybe new ways of getting that validation that in a way that didn't happen before, but it's the same key issue underneath. So yeah, that could be. I think it's just, again, um, th therapy and somebody that knows you and the context and your history could probably pr present more light on this. But um, I guess the important thing for me is to just say that, you know, dreams don't um, foretell any kind of future events uh, in terms of relapse or anything else. Just, uh, but, they, but I think it is worthy to pay attention to, uh, but not freak out over. And so just yeah. see patterns, see trends, and uh, maybe they're an opportunity here. What about listing dreams on a circle plan? A circle plan, for people who don't know, um, oh, yeah. we have an inner kind of red light circle, which is bottom line acting out addiction behaviors. If we engage in those behaviors, we've lost our sobriety. And then we have this, what we call a middle circle, which is, you know, picture a big bullseye. So we're working our way out. So the next circle, the yellow light circle, um, you know, the slippery circle, um, we list, you know, uh, people, places, thoughts, feelings that are slippery for us. And maybe dreams can be slippery. I don't know if they go in that circle or not. And then the outer circle is what we call the green light circle. I started using red, yellow, green because it's just easier for people to see is healthy activities we can engage in instead of the activity. But I've never heard of anybody putting dreams, which we truly have no control over yeah, in, in a see, circle plan. I, I I agree. I think uh, things in a circle plan are things we have some agency over and some control over, and whether it's feeling states or behaviors and dreams. As I said, we don't have any we don't have control over those. And so um, the only thing I can see maybe if there the content is uh, some kind of warning, you know, triggering thing that could be. But I, I think I tend to keep circle plans limited to things that. I have some control over in terms of doing what I do or think yeah. or say. Yeah, so if so, I sit around after I wake up from this dream and fantasize about it for the next three hours or masturbate to it. That's a problem. That goes yeah. in the circle plan. That's a behavior. Yeah. That's a choice that I'm making to exactly this dream uh, into fantasy or masturbation or whatever. Um, right. But yeah, right. so anyway, don't because yeah, so you're taking that kind of a dream and, and, and you're now you're awake you're indulging in fantasy about it. And that's that's a problem for sure. Yeah. But the dream yeah. itself. Yeah, no, don't beat yourself up for having a dream. Um, yeah. And these dreams can be very real. I have woken up, uh, particularly early in recovery, I would wake up and think, oh my God, I did it again. Uh, oh, in a panic. Right. And I'm like, oh, I gotta that's tell right. everybody, I gotta call my sponsor. And like 20 minutes later, I realized, oh, that didn't happen. <laughs> I just dreamed it. Um, and almost every addict has dreams that are that real. So you're in a normal place. Yeah. Um, uh, next one here, I'm male addict in recovery since February, sober since March. Um, are there healthy ways or actions to express or take to address and alleviate the intensity side of addiction? Um, if so, what are some examples? How do I safely communicate them to my partner? We've been talking about intensity a lot lately. We may, might need to do another um, intensity addictions webinar uh, here in the next, next month or so. Um, so anyway, um, how can I alleviate this need for intensity? Um, how do I safely communicate this need for intensity to my partner? Well, first of all, congratulations on your sobriety. That's terrific. Um, and, you know, these are intensity addictions, sex and porn and uh, amphetamines, particularly gambling, work, um, even exercise. So, so as addicts, we can kind of derive this intensity from a lot of different behaviors. Um, and just because some of those behaviors have gotten out of control doesn't mean that we still don't need a little intensity sometimes. We can't live lives of total, you know, boring gray states. But the, the key is how to do it safely without engaging in more obsessive thinking about it. I think one of the examples we've talked about before is different kinds of exercise. Uh, can be useful. Exercise is really healthy for you. Exercise throws off amino acids that help rebuild those dopamine transporters in your brain that are injured by addiction. Um, but remember, intensity addicts can really convert uh, into too much exercise. I've had clients hurt their knees and hips and things from over-exercising. So we got to be careful. So 
I think, again, some kind of accountability person, having somebody you go to the gym with or you work out with um, who understands and gets you and, and is a recovery person. So I think exercise is one way to do it. I think other kinds of, uh, I've had clients, meth users in recovery who were just wired for intensity and liked kind of high intensity sports, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and a lot of them were in their addiction, were doing them solo, like you know, skiing down the, I'm not a skier, but what other, the double X trails or whatever on the backside of the mountain that are unmonitored and really dangerous or, but, and so, yeah, a little, a little bit of that recovery, I think is okay. And, and I, what I would do is we know the power of connection and recovery. I would do those activities with other people in recovery. So uh, the example I use a lot is a friend of mine who was uh, in recovery here from meth uh, where I live and loved uh, that intensity and, and wanted to pair, go parachute jumping. And I suggested that he put together a group of other people in recovery who wanted to do it as well. So suddenly it wasn't just him getting an intensity fix. It was him getting some intensity, but also doing it as a recovery activity. And so I think if you can make it as a, as a recovery activity and do, don't do it solo, do it with other people. I think it, it helps a lot. Um, the other thing, by the way, and that's kind of the really in your face intensity. I think we can also have intensity from trying new things. You know, so. Um, take a cooking class, take a painting class, do, do some kind of, do CrossFit if you've never done it. You know, try something you've never done before. Remember when we are, when we're first learning something, it engages our mind totally. Then the example a lot of people use is learning to drive a car, right? Where the, where's the gas? Where's the brake? Where's the steering wheel? Where's the, and learning how to coordinate it all took a lot of effort. After a while, it's routine, but that that is an intense process for our brain. It engages everything. And so to learn something new, learn a new skill, uh, learn a new activity um, and, and do it with somebody you, you like. And so I think that really is a, there, there are healthy ways to engage that. Um, and just, but the warning here, and this is one of the safety factors of having to do it with somebody else is that it, it keeps kind of a lid on going crazy with it. That's, that's the concern. But I think, yeah, you don't have to live a gray, boring life. You can still have some intensity, but I think we have to be um, sane right. about it. And, and just to jump back into the brain a little bit, like there's a group out here that, that uh, guys from CMA who also did skydiving <laughs> as a group. And it always strikes me that, yeah, sure, they got the adrenaline bump, but they also got some oxytocin and serotonin because they did it together and they were Absolutely. bonding. They got other neurochemicals involved. And intensity addicts, we just pretty much go for the straight adrenaline rush. Um, right. So getting the other activities, other things involved, whether it's you know with a group of guys in recovery or with your partner, you know, take a cooking class together. I love that. You know, uh, I, I need to take a cooking class. I can't cook for shit, but yeah. Or do something. Do something that engages your body. You know, um, I am a novice kayaker, right? But it, kayaking for me is like <laughs> everything is engaged and. Battleboarding, anything that engages your body, your mind, it's a really beautiful way of getting that intensity boost. Yeah. Um, okay, next question here. Um, my sex addict is 56 years old. Um, he sometimes suffers from depression. Um, is depression part of recovery? Should he talk with our family doctor about taking medication? Uh, there are no chemical dependency issues. David, can you first talk about the relationship between depression and anxiety and addiction? and you know chicken and the egg and then maybe talk about what to what to do about it right now right so when we if we were to put on a piece of paper addictive disorders anxiety and depression there would be arrows in every direction from each of those things meaning that anxiety and depression can set the stage for an addictive disorder because people cope sometimes with the addictive things by maybe turning to amphetamines or other kinds of behaviors to Kind of pick themselves up. Some people cope with anxiety by by numbing out, by doing other things to kind of sedate and take the take the edge off that anxiety. And then on the other hand, addictions themselves can create those things. And because addiction does a number in our brains and it throws off the balance, and and depression is very often uh, goes hand in hand with addiction. And surprising to some people, depression can also get aggravated in recovery sometimes. It gets actually worse um, because some of the addictive mechanisms actually counteract some of the depressive forces, right? It, it at least 
keeps our awareness of it at a minimum. It distracts us. We have other sensations and feelings that are going on. We're less mindful of the depression. So in recovery, suddenly those coping mechanisms are gone. We're really feeling it. Um, the other thing that can happen just as a result of depression itself is that the way it affects our brain over time, when we stop the addictive behavior, our brain has already adapted to the addiction. And in the case of intensity addictions like sex and porn, gambling, amphetamines, work, uh, those are all high intensity addictions that really hijack our brain's ability, the baseline we need for stimulus, for stimulation. So when we take that away, suddenly everything in our world is kind of dull and gray. And because there's nothing that hits that bar that our brain got used to. So normal life is not, you know, methamphetamine or porn or sex addiction. Normal life is kind of normal life. And our brains do settle back down to a normal state where we can get good feelings and get excited and be happy over normal stuff. But there's a period of three or four months uh, where this thing we call anhedonia, which means the inability to experience pleasure, is, is prominent. So, so yes, depression can absolutely be um, part of the addictive process and actually get aggravated in recovery. So that said, um, I think it's absolutely appropriate to talk to your family doctor. Uh, I don't think you need a psychiatrist in this case, unless there's something really severe or really severe depressive disorder, but the, the kind of normal low mood, kind of blue, maybe occasionally crying when you don't want to at a, a cinema commercial, that kind of stuff. Um, there's, there's medications uh, called SSRIs, very standard, very safe. Most uh, family doctors will prescribe them and that can help. Uh, keep in mind too, the best uh, protocol for depression is a combination of medication and therapy. Um, but the other thing you can do is just kind of monitor it. Very often those depressive symptoms do even out after a couple months. But if it, it's prolonged, it's especially something to then check out with your doctor because it's very common um, in that case. We see that uh, particularly with amphetamine and most pronounced with methamphetamine users. You say there's no substances here, but for those guys or, or gals that do use amphetamines, uh, the, the way it impacts the brain causes a real bad depression initially in recovery uh, because it really messes up the brain's ability to uh, level out moods. So, so yeah, depression is a, a common uh, feature and it often resolves, but, but not always. So I, I, if the person's really uncomfortable, they might benefit from an SSRI medication. Yeah, yeah I mean, my, my personal experience, I'll, I'll share that. Um, <clears throat> before I was willing to get sober, um, I went to numerous therapists to deal with my depression. Um, and um, of course, I never told them the root of my problem, which was, you know, the fact that I was drinking and drugging and sexing like a crazy person. Um, and, you know, we never made any progress, imagine, um, because I wasn't telling them anything that was true other than I'm, <laughs> I was kind of depressed. Um, when I got into recovery, um, and, and they would never prescribe anything because, you know, they knew I wasn't. <laughs> Just, I wasn't telling them anything useful, um, so they weren't willing to prescribe anything, and good for them. Um, when I finally got into recovery, um, I went on an SSRI, uh, and it was recommended by my sex addiction therapist who sent me to a psychiatrist who said, yeah, you need to go on an SSRI. It was an antidepressant, anti-anxiety med. It worked really well for me, and I am not sure I would have survived early recovery. Uh, without that, because I was so depressed. Um, my life had really crashed, and I no longer had my coping mechanisms because I was yeah. trying to get sober from everything all at once. And um, I was really, really hurting. Um, after about two years of sobriety, I thought, you know what? My life is evened out. Everything's going well. I'm kind of happy. Um, let's try it without the antidepressants. Um, antidepressants are SSRIs, some of them can be hard to get off of. I had to wean myself off and it was still really unpleasant. Um, and I, I went a number of years with no um, medication. And then probably four or five years ago, um, you know, I woke up and I was just like, you know, I, I have this low grade depression and anxiety, uh, you know, and it never, never really went away. So it was probably a 
one of the causes of my addictions. It got much worse with the addiction. And then in early sobriety, it got much, much worse. Um, and then I went back to this baseline that I have. So I went back on the SSRI and, and it's worked great for me. Um, neither David nor I are a fan of treating things with medication. We both think right. the world is over medicated, right. but in certain instances, when there's you know a lot of discussion and um, it can be really helpful to right. get a medication for you know a chemical imbalance in the brain that causes you know depression or anxiety. Right. Um, so I'll just say too, um, and thank you for sharing that, Scott, because it, it is the case for a lot of people that they can um, be on a medication and have benefit for a while, then not need it and go one periods and then go back on it. So over the course of things change, right? And people can be on one antidepressant and it may lose effectiveness after three years or something and just stop working as well. And so it's always kind of an art to, to match what you need and the right medication. And it may be uh, very common actually when people start looking for the right antidepressant, they may have to try a couple before they get one that really works well. So it's, it's a little bit of trial and error. It's not an exact science at all. But um, yeah, I think it wouldn't be my first choice unless it's really severe, but, but I think uh, when you need it, you need it. So. Um, my husband tried to quit certain behaviors like sexting people and using porn in the last few months while we were separated. Um, he started to attend support groups last month and said he recently got a sponsor. However, he is un unwilling or un unable to end all contact with his affair partner of almost two years. Um, I've start started the divorce process because I don't know how to support him through recovery while the affair is still in the picture. Um, is it possible for him to get truly sober if he stays in contact with the affair partner? Uh, that is a very legitimate question. <laughs> and the answer, as you can see from David, is hell no. Yeah, legitimate question, hell no. Um, right, we, we just can't have those strings and those people in recovery. It just, the two just can't coexist. And I know that that seems very dramatic to a lot of guys because that those people have been there kind of, their coping mechanism and escape, their distraction, their diversion, and to let those go seems quite, you know, extreme, but um, there's no good that can come from that. And if he really is committed to recovery, he'd be willing to give those up. And, and I think uh, we see this a lot where people just give up some, but want to keep one or just to kind of bargain. You know, there's that grief process we talk about, right? And there's that, the second stage of his bargaining. I think I, I kind of smell bargaining going on here, but this is a no, you keep, this is a no, this is a deal breaker in my book. You can't, it just can't work. And so I think, you know, the choice you've made with the divorce process may be a good one, maybe appropriate one. And, and maybe that'll be enough to wake him up. But I think that's a clearly a boundary you set and, you know, good for you because uh, that just, that has to change. I don't see any way of working it otherwise. I mean, this is think? like an alcoholic saying, well, beer doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'll quit the vodka and the wine, but beer doesn't count. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm with David 100%. Um, I accidentally skipped over one here. Um, this is from somebody um, who, who has had addictions themselves, but this is uh, someone who's been in a relationship with a sex addict uh, for about 15 years. And this, this person was a sex addict, drug addict, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the, the sex addict, drug addict left this person after 15 years. Um, and the individual says, um, is, is an older person, um, being dropped as an older person leaves me obsessing about the entire story of my life. Um, I'm trying to figure it out and make sense and maybe let go. Um, do you have any advice on, you know, what somebody can do when they're in the relationship that has ended for whatever reason and they're obsessing about it and wondering what they did wrong or what they've been doing wrong or, or you know, questioning everything since our topic is obsession. Um, right. You know, right. relationship yeah, profession, a, what can we do? Hey, that's a painful place. I mean, I've had clients that, um, when again, I'm thinking of particularly who had a relationship, a brief relationship, actually, nothing like this, that ended you know, over three years ago. And he's still 
going through this like obsessive reflection of like, what did I do wrong? And why didn't this person get me? And what's wrong with me? And it's just kind of a lot of obsessive thinking and a lot of uh, feeding into his um, worst fears about himself and, and all of that. So um, I think, first of all, I, I don't know that you say what kind of support you have, but I would encourage you if you don't have it already to, to get a therapist who can, you, you can talk about this stuff with, because, you know, you're going through uh, some grief, obviously, over this, um, and that obsessive, when, when that happens to us, when we're confronted with an incident like this, it just lights up all our, our doubts. Are we enough? Are we lovable? Are we okay, you know, alone? All of that stuff, all those fears, which just lead right to the obsessing. Now, I'll remind you what we talked about at the beginning, obsession are just circular thoughts that don't really lead anywhere. They, they're not helpful. And so that's why I suggested maybe getting a therapist or someone you can talk to about this who can uh, help you with some reality checking of what, what is yours and what is the other person's and kind of making that distinction so you can kind of move on. Because I think right now you're stuck in this, in a grief process. And, and that's a very painful play. Grief, grieving is essential. Grieving hurts sometimes, but the whole point of grieving is to move through it. And when people get stuck in it, uh, it's an extremely painful and debilitating place to be. And I, you're kind of getting there. So I'd hate to see you stuck in there, but I really encourage you to, to get a therapist who can talk to you about some of the solutions. I think it really works with sorting out what happened in a little bit of a postmortem and really looking at your uh, core beliefs about yourself. And you know, that's what I would do anyway as a therapist is look at what, what are your I statements down deep and, and how are those being triggered by this and what can we do to correct those to really see you know, how resilient you are, for example, as opposed to uh, what, might, what you might be thinking about your worst fears about yourself and sort of really pointing out a more realistic portrayal, I think, than your mind maybe is allowing you to see right now in terms of um, what you what you did and who you are and and um, how you're going to fare out of this. So I'd encourage you to get a therapist to talk about it if you if you don't already. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and David, we've talked about this before, sort of obsessing and wallowing in shame, and mm -hmm. you know, this is a way of avoiding the pain of the actual situation, or it can be, totally. um, and it will keep us, as you said, stuck, and and we can't move through the grief process and come out the other side and and move forward with their life, so. Right, there is this state, and you see it sometimes, I do trauma work, and if somebody's having a bad reaction, but they can get caught up in tears or rage or anger or self-berating, but it, it becomes this kind of circular um, emotional, I won't even call it a catharsis, which indicates there's some movement and resolution, but just people get caught up in the, in the emotion and the loop. And that's no good place to be either, right? So there, there has to be movement. And, and that's why I say very often, it's really hard for us to do this on our, on our own. We need that feedback. We need sometimes the guidance. We need a coach to help us. And a therapist can do that uh, um, to get you through that. But yeah, I think, because we can get stuck. And I see this a lot with, with my addicts too, with the shame. With shame, so I was get, just get caught up in the shame, which is, is debilitating. And it's a trap. There's nowhere to go from that. So yeah, I totally agree. Um, I'm going to take these next two questions together. Um, what are your thoughts on using microdosing of psychedelics for sex or porn addiction treatment? And then I've heard recently about medications that diminish cravings, um, since the cravings are so difficult to overcome during early recovery from meth addiction. Can you address this? I'll just say it's a big no for me on microdosing on psychedelics. David may have different thoughts, and and we're on the same page with with the other medications. So David, you're on. Yeah, so, you know, psychedelics, it's so interesting right now because there's, um, there's starting to be certifications in this now that it's, it's really out there and starting. And there's this very promising research on uh, MDMA, for one thing, for post-traumatic stress disorder. But for me, it's still in the early, early stages. And I think for I've me- seen, I've like, seen bad results. That's, that's why I'm so anti. I've well, seen yeah. really bad results. Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, yeah, ketamine is out there too and has bad yeah. results as well. So my point is that when it gets down, and I think it's still nascent, but when they get some expertise with it, um, as a recovering addict myself, 
I have no business going there. Now, I may feel differently in 10 years if we see a lot of research and literature, but man, it, I could get into yeah, the, a therapeutic ecstasy. Sounds pretty good to me. Uh, doesn't really work with my my recovery right now. So I'm when really you see cautious. David and I like dressed like club kids and like dancing at 3 a.m., <laughs> you'll know we have we have flipped on, on microdosing. <laughs> Um, I want to say, though, now that said, there is really promising research. We have been looking for some kind of drug or drug combination that would quell methamphetamine cravings for years. And we looked at Wellbutrin and all these kind of old antidepressants. And a year ago today, and, or this week, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, came out with an article that basically showed moderate success in reducing methamphetamine cravings. Uh, with a combination of two drugs, our friend naltrexone, which has been used to reduce alcohol and opioid cravings. Uh, it, part of it is the formula is used to reduce opioid overdoses. So naltrexone is very familiar to us and Wellbutrin, a very common antidepressant that works with dopamine. Those two things in, combine, in combination um, had moderate to significant success in reducing uh, not only meth cravings, there. There's also research that showed they reduce some cravings for sex addiction. So um, the naltrexone, anyway. So yeah, there's 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 research. So th there's stuff happening all over the place right now. But so yes, for um, naltrexone and wellbutrin, from my point of view, no to this microdosing on psychedelics. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in complete agreement. There's one more question, but it's a big question. There's no way we have time to answer it today. And we're out of time. So I'm going to actually copy this and it? paste it and save it for next week because I think it's a great question. So if you ask this question, please come back next week and I promise we'll answer it and we'll answer it first. Um, David, thank you. Great topic tonight. Thank you for the great questions, everybody. Yeah, um, thank you. Anything you want to say to take us out? Just remember, if you're in that obsessive place, get some help, break it because it's, it's not leading you anywhere. There's no solutions there. Just trouble. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Thank night. Take care. Bye-bye, Scott.